Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad that you're with us to stay curious. Background is the beautiful Gemini mm -hmm. Monument out there at Space View Park. Uh, behind me, I'll probably show you a smaller version of this, is the Vehicle Assembly Building. And we're going to do a little program today honoring Apollo 17 that 24 years ago completed a successful failure going down in the book uh, uh, 54 years ago. And a uh, little look back at that. Apollo 16 is headed to the moon. So there's a little bit of a, a, a kismet going on there that some of you space geeks know what I'm talking about. Uh, having to do with the crew, uh, a little irony of sorts uh, being played out uh, uh, in space history at this time. So uh, uh, hope you enjoyed today's show. Please tell your friends that we're on YouTube and we being Marty Winkle, my co-producer and I, we've done about a thousand, almost a thousand forty episodes, uh, hit four years, born out of the pandemic in March 2020. Boy, sure, everyone surely forgot about that pandemic, Marty. Um, anyway, hi, brother. How you doing on that UCAC mi family microphone there? I'm doing good on the UCAC mic. How are you doing? <laughs> good, good. Marty, you put together uh, many Grumman reunions over a, a, probably a 30-year span uh, where they honored uh, at different uh, milestones of the Apollo landings, like the 10th, 15th, 20th, and 25th, and all that. You had these parties. Uh, I was privileged to be part of the Apollo 13 splashdown celebration. The last one of these that you had, January 29th, 2022. Wow, that was two years ago, Marty. Can you believe that? And uh, uh, Marty worked so hard on these. It was a love fest of the Grumman workers who built the only spacecraft still, the only spacecraft ever built to be operated and designed to only operate in the vacuum of space by two people standing up, not able to return to Earth and land and lift off an alien world. Nobody's done that. And Marty, I'm so proud of the Grumman men and women that I met over the years because of you. Uh, uh, and realize what a uh, labor of love in each one of these modules, each one of these lunar modules given a, a number. And today we're going to be talking about uh, number seven, LEM7, and uh, command service module number 109 from North American Rockwell. Um, so anyway, the pride in this, this spacecraft was a hundredfold after the Apollo 13 landed on this date, April 17th, 1970, because this this became their lifeboat designed to keep two men alive for two days. It kept three men alive for four and a half days, almost five days. So uh, we're going to look back at this a little bit. I've been super busy and hit the ground running as usual. And I saw this and I thought that I'd be reminded of uh, by our good friend and astronaut Nicole Stott to stay grounded. All right, an example of staying grounded is, yep, those are my feet, Marty. Just just get get out there and touch Mother Earth, okay, uh, and, and believe that we are just earthlings on this planet, and together we need to treat each other like crewmates, not like passengers. And the global climate change alarms have certainly uh, made an awareness of that. So uh, thank you, Nicole, for your beautiful book uh, that you know I love, Back to Earth, Lessons Learned uh, from Nicole. If you don't have this, you need to order it today. It's not your typical astronaut. I wanted to be an astronaut. I grew up here and I did this and that. Uh, and I love space. It's more like when she came back to Earth, her position as an astronaut brought her people on Earth that told about uh, things that needed to be solved. And, of course, Nicole's also about art and healing in space. So one of our great friends, uh, supporters of this museum, Nicole Stott, lives over in St. Petersburg with her husband, Chris Stott, also a great supporter. All right. 
Well, let's talk about this crew here. Uh, of course, um, I'm going to put my glasses on, but most space geeks can recite the whole story of the Apollo 13 launch on uh, uh, launched at uh, 1313, I think, uh, on April 11th, uh, 1970. The lunar landing was aborted after an oxygen tank in the service module ruptured two days into the mission. If it had happened three days into the mission, or two and a half days into the mission, they would have never made it back. Yes, Marty. Or if it happened any time earlier, they wouldn't have made it back. Oh, but is that right? You know, if the tank blew, how are you going to... You still have to... And you're powering down everything, including in the command module. How are you going to dock with the, the uh, lunar module? Gotcha. So, yeah. So there's a lot of... 13, uh, what is that called? Trichinosis, uh, if you're fear of the number 13 going into this. Uh, there's the launch, there's the crew that Jim Lovell is the oldest living person to go to space at age 95 years old. Buzz Aldrin's right behind him at 94. That's Jack Swigert in the middle. Jack Swigert died of cancer about 20 years ago after being elected to the, uh, I'm not sure if it was the Senate or uh, of the U.S., but politics in Colorado. And there's Mr. Fred Hayes, who's pushing 90 years old, and we call him Fredo, and Fred's been a, a, a board member emeritus for our American Space Museum uh, because of our godfather, Charlie Mars, and Charlie was the NASA manager over the astronauts involved with the lunar module. And there is another kismet, Marty, and you know this, who knew more about the lunar module than any other astronaut? in the NASA crews. Well, yeah. yeah, I'm asking you, who, who, who was the most experienced because he was the key man at Grumman to learn every nut and bolt of that lunar module? Our friend Fredo. That had been Fred Hayes, exactly. So how lucky was that, that he understood the noises that, that, that might have freaked out the other people? The other thing about this story was this is the only first and only time that Jack Swigert was inside the lunar module. As the command module pilot, he had no reason to be inside of it. And so he was never, ever inside of one. And I kind of think that's kind of weird, Marty, that they would have, wouldn't they would have had an abort thought in their mind that they would have to use that and, and, and uh, let's just familiarize yourself with it or something like that. Because the other two lunar module pilots were somewhat familiar with the command module if they had to pilot at home, of course, with a lot of help. So uh, there's one of them in the upper right being carried up to the, uh, um, in a basket after the dramatic safety there. Uh, so um, here's the original crew. Now, I also want to think, well, you know, this is 1970. Marty had no clue what was going on in 1970 with uh, the Beatles breaking up and, and uh, disco coming on and all this stuff. Uh, because you were working your butt off on this lunar modules to get us to the moon. And they admit that they didn't have time for family and regular news and so forth. Well, here is the original crew, Lovell, and in the middle is Ken Mattingly, who was going to be the command module pilot, and Fred Hayes. And Ken was exposed to one of uh, Charlie Duke, astronaut Charlie Duke's children, that, that uh, came down with the measles. And, uh, and this was like a week before the flight, the launch. And when this was found out, he, they, had to, they didn't want everyone on the crew getting measles. They didn't know if, if Madeline was going to get measles. It was just one of those little faux pas things that nobody knew who had the measles. And he was in that same room. And uh, uh, so the NASA, in a bold move, replaced him with Jack Swigert there. Now, two years later... There's Ken Mattingly on the left on the way to the moon with Charlie Duke, whose kid may have exposed, or grandchild or someone in his family may have exposed him to the measles. Nobody got the measles, all right? Uh, they had some little code that said, did you get orange juice or something like that? And no, I didn't get any orange juice or whatever. So uh, Ken Mattingly just passed away last year at age 87 uh, and... Uh, uh, John Glenn, uh, Young passed away at age 87 about five years ago, uh, born in uh, San Francisco, but raised in Orlando. So we have the John Young Parkway named after him. 
where every day we hear about the John Young Parkway because there's always some mishap or traffic jam on it. And then Charlie Duke is 87, 88 uh, in August, I believe, so or in October, actually. The youngest person to walk on the moon at age 36 and, and almost age 37 is Charlie Duke. So uh, they are on the way to the moon right now. We posted a picture of that yesterday. And here's our good friend Chris Callie and his beautiful montages of the Apollo 16 launch featuring Charlie Duke on the left. Now, Marty, I want to just apprise you that uh, we have a, a healthy group of people in the world that do not think we went to the moon. And I respect their opinions about anything, all right? But now they are populating our Facebook page and saying with all kinds of sometimes venom even uh, that we didn't go to the moon or or they put a clown on the moon this clown emoji is what people post and and laughing at you okay and please do that on our facebook site because i immediately block you forever from our facebook site we don't want nothing to do with you if you don't want nothing to do with us marty winkle was a space worker that worked his butt off to put America on the moon six times uh, and built helped build this machine electrically was, was your deal, Marty, that it saved the life of these three astronauts. So uh, keep it up. Uh, my, my wrist got sore from blocking a lot of people today. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have the artifacts, the proof. And Marty, these people have been so unpolite, let me put it, that more than one has said that our museum is an embarrassment that we take money from people for phony artifacts. All right. Uh, so uh, we respect your opinion, but leave it off of our website. Other space websites have the same problem. I mean, Facebook pages like Space Hipsters and so forth. And uh, we know people are just trying to get your goat and goad you uh, in there. And we don't, we don't interact with you. You are just out of here okay so uh that's my comment on some of the p on the uh the conspiracy theory people uh you're welcome your conspiracy theories find your own facebook page and and wear it out well here is the launch of apollo 13. they all look pretty much alike uh uh, uh it, but there's nuances that you can tell which is which um and here's what happened, the damage, the three best pictures that were taken and uh, uh, approaching Earth, not knowing if their heat shield is going to hold up because it got too cold, not knowing for sure if they're on the exact path into the Earth, coming in at almost 40,000 miles an hour. They have to jettison the service module, and then they got an idea, horrifically, where the panel was blown off by the explosion of an oxygen tank. The Investigation Review Board found fault with pre-flight testing of the oxygen tank and Teflon being placed inside it. The board recommended changes, including minimizing the use of potentially combustible items inside the tank. All right, meaning that Teflon was one of the agents that blew up. This was done for Apollo 14. The story of Apollo 13, of course, has been dramatized many times most notably by the 1995 film uh, Apollo 13, based on Jim Lovell's book Lost Moon. And um, I think I've got a reminder of that. Well, you know, I didn't load that up. All right, so I mentioned it there. Yes, that, that the Apollo 13 movie by Ron Howard, old Opie on Andy Griffith, but a great director. Uh, without a doubt... Uh, the NASA community, Marty, and, and, and chime in, if you will, um, think that Apollo 13 is the most accurate movie made to depicting NASA. Uh, there's a few little things in there, like uh, uh, when one of them gets a little, little slap happy or something in there, and Tom Hanks' jab slaps him around a little bit to straighten up. I think it's uh, Gary Sinise was one astronaut, and Kevin Bacon, the other one. Uh, because I didn't load up the poster on there. So anyway, this is what it looked like. Super, super enhanced images 50 years later. There is Aquarius, lunar module number seven that saved the lives of these men. And it was not intended to do anything like that.
you're looking at the docking port there, uh, probably after they separated from it and said goodbye to it. And uh, then it, uh, Marty, did it burn up in Earth's atmosphere? No, Mark, I, I think so. I'm not totally sure. I'm... Dave Sting, you'll know, or no, I know who they're going to know is uh, Doug Forrest will let us know if it burned up in the atmosphere or not. Apollo 10 command module still circling the sun and, and going to make an Earth orbit close by in about a few years. This was one of the more dramatic pictures taken as the astronauts had no choice but to loop around the moon, use the lunar modules, the scent motor, to slow them down in a free return orbit and bring them back safely. So not knowing whether anyone was ever going to see this film again, because uh, if they died, we would never be able to retrieve the spacecraft back. Uh, they took these outstanding photos of a quick loop around the moon. And that's what uh, uh, Artemis 2 is going to do, is loop around the moon for about 3,000 miles. So, uh, all right. So here's the astronauts in space up there. Uh, Lovell, uh, Schweikert, and Hayes in there. One of the they did take pictures of themselves in space. It was very cold in there. It got down to the high 30s. Uh, Fred Hayes, of course, and, and all you space geeks know a lot about this. 52 years later, after all, or 54 years later, uh, Marty. I'm trying to put words in your mouth, but. It was it's kind of we're going to dismiss an urban legend about how sick Fred Hayes was. Have you heard him talk about that, Marty? Yeah, I have. It, the movie depicts it where he's was sicker than he actually was. Yes. Um, and that's an engineer's succinct description of it. Thank you, Marty. <laughs> you know, uh, it said he was sick and had kidney infections and all this stuff. And uh, no, he said he he felt good. You know, he he it wasn't, and that's exactly what he said, Marty. That the movie made him a lot sicker or iller than than he actually was. And uh, but uh, so then you get in the lunar the you know three day coast to get back to Earth. Uh, wondering if you're ever going to make it. What you're really wondering is can you power up the command module? And when they got inside, because of the condensation, it was dripping wet. When they put those breakers in there, like think of your home breakers that you might pull out in your garage there to, to do something, put a new ceiling fan in your in your bedroom and you pull the breaker out. Well, pulling that in, you don't think about pulling it in like these guys did because it was wet. They didn't know if the electricity was going to start a uh, fire. They didn't smell anything. And that was a lot due again to the kismet, the good fortune, but the tragedy of Apollo 1. Because after Apollo 1, every insulation uh, on the command module and the lunar module, right, Marty, were waterproofed. Okay. Gee, Boeing should have thought about that on their Starliner, Marty, uh, that they had to uh, rewire because their wiring wasn't waterproofed. Can't make this stuff up. We wish that the, the companies of now would really... Read some of the history books because you are repeating some of the le uh, the bad things out there, uh, and the lessons learned should be going forward. Well, um, the crew experienced great hardship caused by limited power, a chilly and wet cabin, and shortage of water. There was a critical need to scrub the carbon dioxide, what that was going to kill them. All right, the scrubber machine for the c c command modules cartridges filters were round and the ones for the lunar module were square and they had and uh, again another i don't know if they ever made them universal after this flight but they should have uh the astronauts peril captivated the world and i am a young man just got my driver's license and the world was on edge uh, maybe more people paid more attention to this, Marty, on a daily basis than I think Apollo 11's moon landing. Yes, sir, you have a comment or question? Well, first, based on what you just said, the duration was a lot longer, so there would be more attention being paid to Apollo 13. But at any given incident, I would think Apollo 11 and 13 were pretty close. Yeah. But anyway, uh, Doug Forrest says Apollo 13 limb did burn up in the atmosphere. It had a radioactive uh, element on board, which had to be taken into consideration on where it was brought down 
It was aimed at a deep part of the ocean somewhere near Australia. And I think he's talking about the RTG. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Um, the RTG was the power for the Apollo Lunar Science Experiment Package, the ALSAP on there. So thank you, Doug. Uh, um, he's working out there in Hollywood, uh, making up some more stuff about the moon. So uh, I can block you. All right. But that's exactly what they're doing, Doug, is they're thinking that we had CG type of things. And he's an illustrator uh, uh, out there uh, with the, the technology. And Doug's also, we bragged about his excellent uh, pencil drawings of the Apollo era and so forth. Um, but yeah, the uh, so thank you, Doug, for chiming in on that. All right, so um, <laughs> what we've got left here to talk about Apollo 13, uh, there is the actual Houston uh, and Gene Krantz sitting there with his white, van, uh, white vest. You can see the astronaut looks like Hayes up there in the, the picture up there. And, and our good friend, Mr. Jay Honeycutt, was in those in that room with the three trying uh, with the three windows there. That's where the sim uh, simulators were. The sim engineers and Jay did a wonderful program about being a sim engineer in there. And uh, but they never did a simulation like this. <clears throat> there are the astronauts. A picture taken after they got back safely. I find that kind of interesting that uh, uh that swigert had to you know a photo call we gotta have we gotta pretend like these pictures were taken before we went so uh but i'm sure they didn't have to be asked to smile because they are very fortunate folks uh uh fred hayes has has always been very active on the space coast in houston area and his home around biloxi mississippi uh and the uh wonderful um uh, Infinity Museum, that's the gateway to Marshall Space Center there at the border of Mississippi and Louisiana. Uh, I just can't say enough about how Fred has helped mm -hmm. this museum grow, and I'm gonna. That's why it dawned on me. Let's throw in some Space View Park for y'all to see how how Fred helped us raise a million dollars uh, 20 years ago for this idea concept there. So. Uh, Think about, I mean, Marty, uh, I, it was very big news. Uh, headline, of course, for days. Uh, the day that they came back, April 17th. I should have looked up what day of the week it was. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm reminded of the Times Square in New York City and the ticker tape thing that they have going on that, you know, you see it play in the movie Astronauts Home Safe, you know. And uh, this was a true drama of life and death that's never been played out like this uh, uh, and in, in, a, in a space way, okay? Uh, so I thought we'd end Apollo 13 by looking back at this uh, gorgeous uh, artwork, the Odyssey and Aquarius. The Apollo 13 mission patch features Apollo, the sun god of Greek mythology, symbolizing how the Apollo flights extended the light of knowledge to all mankind. Apollo's chariot is flying across space. The Latin phrase ex luna scientia means from the, from the moon knowledge. The design was created by artist Lumen Winter, and the final artwork was done by Norman Tiller. Okay. Now, what, Marty, strikes you as different about this patch from the other Apollo patches except one? No astronaut names. Correct. The humble Jim Lovell did not want the names of his crew on there. He wanted it to be a symbol of, Na of the, the NASA space worker. This was going to be the third mission, a very ambitious mission compared to the first two, that Apollo 11, that does also not have the names of astronauts, um, uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, nor does this one have the names of James Lovell, uh fred hayes or uh jack schweikert yes marty bill white is asking me were any modifications made to the remaining unflown limbs as a result of the apollo 13 explosion and as far as i know bill uh, no modifications were made but that does not mean they weren't made i just don't recall any any modifications so they didn't modify the uh uh, carbon dioxide uh, filters to be one size fits all 
Not that I know of Mark, but you no. Know, in, in hindsight, just thinking about it, they may have made an adapter. It would be a lot simpler and less expensive to make an adapter to go from square to round versus replacing a whole unit. Just, right. just a thought. I don't know. Good, good, good. Well, we hope that you. Oh, we got a couple things to add. Okay. Um, to our Apollo 13 program, I, I've been to the co uh, the Cosmosphere is an outstanding place this was a poor picture to choose uh but that's the heat shield of uh um apollo 13 uh, lives there at the cosmosphere in hutchinson kansas it must be on your bucket list uh that's definitely me because of my bald spot on there um and uh i i Kind of threw this program together hastily and didn't grab a front picture of it. I believe they're doing some renovation work on it too, there. But uh, so Jim Lovell wrote uh, some personal letters to people, and this uh, uh, the whole crew did. And this says Apollo 13's mission fell short with respect to accomplishing the objectives, both uh, around and on the moon. It uh, lowercase moon too. That drives me nuts. Moon's a personal pronoun. Capitalize it there. It did, however, serve to highlight the skill and efforts of many people necessary to perform a mission with or without problems. Please accept this LSAT pin flown to the moon uh, on, on Apollo 13 as a token of the appreciation for your efforts to, uh, before and during the flight. So, uh, boy, you get something like that, and that is real signatures of those astronauts there. Uh, that's worth a, a little bit of money. So, uh, of course, uh, after tragedy happens, then comes the levity, right? You've got to make, you got to be some self-effacing uh, humor, uh, looking in the face of death. So, um, what uh, what happened was um, uh, uh, North American, okay, uh, North American Rockwell. Uh, received a bill from Grumman for towing of the for towing back uh, the uh, the, uh, the the crew of the command module and so forth. Okay, uh, so this is uh, the North American, and we have it right here. Marty brought Marty at these things has had a display of it there, so we'll look at both of these here real quick. But this is an invoice with a, a real Rockwell uh, North American Rockwell invoice. And uh, Scott McLeod, you remember Scotty McLeod, Marty? Oh, sure. Of course you do. He got me that copy of it. And this he passed away at age 95. And we became fast friends for the last five years of his life. Uh, wasn't on our formal Stay Curious, but we did a recorded show with him. He said, Mark, Sam is the author. And Scott McLeod was one of the Grumman astronauts that trained the astronauts and did everything in a spacesuit. And this guy, Scotty, particularly was on Walter Cronkite on Apollo 11, walking down the ladder and simulating what everything was going to do. Uh, he said, Mark, Sam is the author of this ditty. He was one of my pilots at Grumman and now lives in New York. Credit goes to Sam Greenberg. Uh, stay healthy is what he, he appears on this. So uh, don't think I'm going to answer that phone. Thank you. Uh, and Scott, and I, boy, I cherish that from him there. So, uh, this starts out with, uh, and I'll show you your version there, Marty, uh, uh, towing, uh, four, 400,000 and one miles. All right. Towing $4 the first mile, <laughs> $4 the first mile. Uh, let me just get rid of that. Okay. I apologize for that there. So uh towing, four dollars the first mile, a dollar each additional mile. Okay. Trouble call, fast service. So they charge them four hundred thousand and four dollars for towing. Battery charge, uh customers jumper cables, okay, four dollars and five cents for that. Uh it's five cents a kilowatt uh plus road call plus five cents a kilowatt hour hour so it's four dollar road call and five cents oxygen at ten dollars a pound 50 pounds of that 500 bucks sleeping accommodations for two no tv air conditioning with radio modified american plan with a view and they got the account nasa account 
number there for travel and it was prepaid <laughs> i love that additional guests in the room of the lunar module now at eight dollars a night check out no later than noon friday 4 17 70. accommodations not guaranteed beyond that time so they charged they charged schweiker uh 32 i mean uh, uh jack um they charged um yeah schweiger 32 dollars for four nights room water no charge personalized trip tick including all transfers baggage handling and gratuities no charge and uh they gave them a 20 percent commercial discount two percent cash discount net 30 days for a three hundred and twelve thousand four hundred and twenty one dollar and twenty one cents towing bill receiving receive was delivered to the uss iwo jima by air express okay so i have that in my hands sent to me by the late scott Mc mcleod uh and uh <clears throat> and here's marty's version of it here that you blew up for everybody at the uh, uh grumman events uh and this was uh to mr tj o'malley who was the vice president of north american rockwell who built the the uh command module cs number 109 all right and uh a cablegram apparently said from beth page new york and there you have the the particulars air conditioning at five dollars a day and room and board so, mark that three hundred twenty four thousand dollars was 1970 dollars not 2024. wow so you could just put a zero behind this really uh 50 years later so it'd be three million dollars on there so and uh, and tj o'malley failed to see the humor behind this pardon me tj o'malley yeah failed to see the humor oh he did <laughs> surprise surprise from what i hear about mr o'malley uh uh he uh yes that was we'll have a program about him one day uh there's some three giants of the industry that we probably wouldn't have got there with them but they were pretty hard to work for uh but maybe it took that uh, uh being a boss of uh a spaceship going to the moon is not a popularity contest definitely so, uh, but I didn't know T.J. O'Malley's reaction to that. Well, I'll ask John Tribe about that <clears throat> at the next luncheon there and get the lowdown on that. For next year's edition of Stay Curious in Apollo 13, safe on the earth 54 years ago today. And uh, like I said, un unfortunately, Mr. Schweiger died of cancer uh, before he could reap the, the love and everything that Fred Hayes and Jim Lovell get. And uh, check out Apollo 13. If you've not seen the Apollo 13 movie, I may crank that up over the weekend again. I haven't seen it in a while. Uh, like the franchises of Star Wars and Indiana Jones, they run it pretty quick, frequently on TBS or TNT. One of those stations runs it a lot. So, But do see it. Uh, uh, Tom Hanks is Jim Lovell, Gary Sinise. I'm not sure which one he plays and which one Kevin Bacon plays. Um, uh, Lowell... Uh, Jim Lovell's wife, Marilyn, is a very big figure in this. She's the pathos from the family of what's going on. And uh, uh, watch a behind-the-scenes thing of that, Marty. They just had a replica of the command module that they, I mean, it was like sections of it. And it's like in a warehouse. And they're just, it's, you can't believe how crude the filming of it looks, of course. And then they made the guys float in space very accurately, so... All right, Hollywood blockbuster, Apollo 13, uh, 1995, I believe that came out. Uh, this uh, was the real deal, and uh, we're so happy. It had a happy ending. Then I'll just make a comment that, Marty, I really think Apollo 14 is so underrated for being the return to the, the flight. You know, we really look at STS-26 uh, with bravery and, and, and fortitude uh, uh, for, uh, for that mission. Uh, after the Columbia accident and then, I mean, Challenger accident. And, and then, of course, STS-114 was the return to flight after the, the Columbia disaster. And 14's not looked like in that light, really, in history. And I think it should. It was led by Alan Shepard, America's first astronaut, who had only 15 minutes uh, uh, on the moon. Edgar Mitchell was his uh, buddy going uh, on the moon. And... Um, uh, orbiting the moon was um, 
Oh, help me out there. I knew I was going to forget that too quick. Uh, Orbiting the Moon on Apollo 14. <laughs> but they were both rookies. And so, uh, and it was a, a a tough mission in a tough place. And Shepard landed the most pinpoint landing of all. All right. So we're looking at who was the command module pilot for Apollo 14? Rusa. Rusa. Stu Rusa. Thank you. All right, everybody, we're going to take out Stay Curious. Wow, it took a little bit of time on that, which is okay. And we're going to talk a little bit about our uh, uh, Space View Park here uh, 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 very quickly. Um, uh, uh, we, uh, Those of you that have been on the coast here have seen our Space View Park. Uh, it's gorgeous. This is how the museum was started. The Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and Shuttle monuments are dedicated to the workers and astronauts of these programs. We even have an in-line-of-duty monument. Uh, our history is the U.S. Space Walk of Fame Foundation was created in 1988 when a local physician wrote to a Titusville City Council suggesting a project to preserve space history and honor men and women in our program. Specifically, that... that uh, uh, a dentist was named Chastain, and he wanted, he saw the Grumman's Chinese Theater monuments in Hollywood and said, why don't we do that with our handprints of, of astronauts instead of the Hollywood people, actors and actresses. Uh, well, led by space pioneers, community leaders, and former space workers, the U.S. Space Walk of Fame Foundation was created in 1988, and it raised over a million dollars to build this beautiful park. You see those pylons have the names of space workers like Marty Winkle on there who gave us $100. And then the the tilted slanted uh, area is a handprint in bronze of an astronaut from each of the monument programs. And if they were deceased in 1999 through 2005 when they built this, uh, they had a bust made of them, a, a relief by the artist Sandy Storm. So I'm going to go through this and buff it up and make a, a, a single program out of it. But there's our Mercury Monument on the shores of the Indian River. The Brewer Bridge in the back, the Max Brewer Bridge, um, goes to uh, uh, Merritt Island Wildlife Refuge. And uh, on the bottom there, you got some handprints in bronze, and the bricks have names on them under the iconic Mercury symbol, the Greek symbol for the planet Mercury or the god Mercury with a seven in it. And those are names on there, uh, and uh, most of them are the early founders of this museum. Uh, they had sold them out by the time you were involved, I think, Marty. Uh, the pavers around this are fabulous. There we have a paver for Robert Goddard. Yeah, Marty, hadn't gotten Goddard in there in a while. We love Robert Goddard. And uh, there's the Project Mercury, and there's an idea of some of the names that are printed there. Do I see any any VIP? Yeah, John Tribe there, General Dynamics, uh, who's been on our show. Uh, hopefully you watched John Tribe's re, uh, rerun from our vault uh, while I was on vacation a week ago. Uh, we have other pavers to the each of the Mercury astronauts and their flight there. Okay, matching their symbols. And I was astonished to put my hands on Deke Slayton, original Mercury astronaut. And as I did, I'm going, wait a minute. Where's the finger on his left hand? The ring finger on his left hand is chopped off. I mean, is this vandals or what? No, no, couldn't be vandals because you can see it's part of the relief. Yes, Deke Slayton lost his ring finger on his left hand as a young boy on his farm in Sparta, Wisconsin, I think it is, uh, and uh, with, on a, with an axe or something. He accidentally chopped it off. He became an astronaut. You know, uh, he, was, he didn't shake your hand left-handed, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, there. Uh, and I kind of did a little research on it. And yeah, NASA knew. But of all the digits that you don't need, that's probably the one that you'd never, ever need anything for unless you were a typist. And uh, now you will be looking at pictures of Deke Slayton from now on. And yep, he's got that left hand in his pocket lots of times to hide that finger. Now you know. 
Well, there's the beautiful condos that they built instead of the uh, uh, Apollo and shuttle going up the coast there. Uh, the land got bought out from them. But I took this picture today. And boy, they have built a bridge, a pedestrian bridge from the uh, Space View Park in Mercury over to the Gemini part over there. And I know a lot of people that don't go to the Gemini uh, monuments because you have to access it off the street and, and walk from the Apollo area. And, and it's easy to miss, actually, though it's beside these beautiful condos. But uh, the, the slow tide, it's, it's not very deep there. <clears throat> and there's some pelicans and egrets there. And I took these two pictures. So when you're here, it's not open yet. Uh, I think they're waiting for the concrete to cure out a little bit because it's all done. They got benches, lighting. It's going to be great and get people over to see Gemini. Yes, Marty, you had a question. You've got a question from uh, Mark Usiak. Question for me. Did they breathe any consumables out of the Pliss backpacks on the return home? And Mark, I, that's an excellent question. I don't know. Uh, again, it's a good question. Uh, I'll try and contact uh, Fredo and uh, try and get an answer for you. Good okay. question. Yeah, if, if they brought back consumables from the for souvenirs type of thing, yeah, right? No, did they breathe it? Did, did they? Did, did they breathe air? Did they, did they use the... Did, the uh, oxygen from the Pliss. Oh, oh, I guess on the return. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. And you had another comment, Marty? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, well, anyway, we're excited to have this happen, and there is a launch at five something today. Yawn. Oh, another launch today, Marty, at five thirty. Um, but uh, no, it'll be it's hardly any daylight launches, so that'll be fun to watch. Well, here is the entrance into the Gemini that we've got this picture that I've made that was behind there. And you see that it, not, it has names of workers carved in marble. And that's too expensive and they're not going to do that anymore. But it's all for Gemini workers, okay, on there. And uh, there's the the iconic two, letter number two for uh, the twins. And the hint prince of uh, John Young there. Now... The rebarb is rusted through. They've tried to fix it. This is an old picture after the fix. But the fix isn't working out too good either. They also have pavers for each mission. Uh, I just happened to grab John Young's file there. And Gus Grissom, March 23rd, historic flight of Molly Brown. And there's my handprints on Geno's there. Okay, and birds fly by occasionally it looks like there. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, these were harvested mostly by uh, uh, our godfather, Charlie Mars. And uh, there's this iconic picture there. Right there is the VAB, Vehicle Assembly Building, about nine miles away from that, that picture. Probably a little closer, probably about eight miles from that distance. We're about nine miles away. A beautiful stainless steel made by Sandmeyer in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, donated the stainless steel that you see in these pictures. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, Mercury Monument was dedicated May 12th, 1995. Okay. The Gemini groundbreaking was in July 96, and it took a year to build. So it was dedicated November 7th, 1997. So it's been around uh, 17 years. That's something that I think maybe might shock a little bit of you. I thought these were around for a longer time than the, just 20 years. But no, we're looking at a 20-year time frame here. We're coming up on the 20th year, May 12th, 2025. Uh, uh, we'll mark um, 2025. Uh, uh, 20, yeah, that'll mark 30 years. What am I saying? Th 30 to that. The Mercury Monument in 90, 95, then 96. Um, so we're looking at 30-year history here. I can't add when it gets up to this number. Uh, there's Mr. John Borline up there on that one. You know, we have him in our back room in a picture. Uh, there's looking at uh, President Kennedy, uh, a beautiful sculpture of him. Tell you a little more about that in a second. The Apollo groundbreaking was precisely at 9.32 a.m., 30 years after the liftoff of Apollo 11 on July 16, 1999. 
Uh, the groundbreaking kicked off a week-long 30-year anniversary celebration for Apollo 11 in the first moon landing. And then this got dedicated. It took um, a few years to build. It is dedicated May 2007. And they had to raise money for eight years to build it. Uh, we have an in-line-of-duty monument there where people who lost their lives are there. Um, and, the, and so um, now... What about this museum, Dave Stang, he's saying? When did the museum come about? Our foundation, the U.S. Space Walk of Fame Foundation, that's our legal nonprofit where you have generously donated money, tax deductible, uh, was founded in 1988. The museum did not come around until 2001. Okay. All right. So our museum is just 13 years old, and it's been in about six different locations in that 13 years. 23. I mean, I'm sorry, 23 years. I go, yeah, 13 sounded too much. I told you I can't add. Yeah, 23 years has been in different locations, six different locations. We do own the building we've been in now for about seven years. So uh, the, the foundation went 23 years without even thinking about a museum. Okay. Uh, uh, no, uh, eight, uh, uh, 13 years. Yeah, 13 years after the... Uh, 13 years after we created the uh, foundation of the U.S. Space Walk of Fame, then the museum came about. Why did that come about, you ask? Because people kept going into the, the office where they were selling these plaques and put your name on this and that and saying, my dad died. Here's a box of stuff we found in his closet. He worked as a contractor at NASA. And uh, literally, that's how the artifacts of this museum started the collection men and women that started categorizing it realized that they could ask for other things and NASA started giving us stuff and on loan and so forth. And the rest is history. And that's why I, I proudly say that the artifacts you see in the American Space Museum, we have the providence that that vehicle assembly building model here just doesn't look cool in our Apollo gallery. We have the paperwork that says that VAB model was in a wind tunnel test in 1960 when they were built before they were even broke ground for the thing so that's what we're all about well here is president kennedy uh, sandy storm's beautiful likeness of him so accurate that when caroline kennedy his, his of course uh her his daughter saw it she wanted to buy it and they'd already broke the mold and we weren't going to sell it to her but it is a very accurate in the words of his famous speech at rice university we will go to the moon not because it's easy but because it's hard and um, uh, i took that photograph and it was a just a gorgeous gorgeous polarizing filter day for the the sky and clouds when i photographed that there tommy usiak you know the polarizing technique again the uh, uh sandmeyer uh is the me uh, metal company in pittsburgh that donated that to them and we've had them visit our museum from time to time some of the family members well around this sandy storm made reliefs in bronze of different monumental things uh, of the mission also the earth and the moon are there and uh, this is the celebration side of the successful moon landing and then this is a the, where it all begins where you see the uh, 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 the, the, the way to chose uh, the, the lunar orbit rendezvous, okay, by the physicist from Iowa. Uh, oh my gosh, I forgot his name. He's up there in the upper left. But you get the idea, the product, this is the production side of where things had to be built. You got workers there. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of that guy's name. And he's so important that we put him up there because there was a debate on... Uh, whether to do Earth orbit rendezvous, direct to the moon and land and come back in a spaceship, or take two spaceships uh, to the moon and have one land and the other come up. So uh, Marty's looking that up there. I, I know he's a Iowa professor, and somebody will shout it out there to us. This is what these uh, reliefs look like. Pete Conrad had already passed away when uh, they got this done. Uh, like I said, it was dedicated in... Uh, 19, uh, Pete had died in 1999 when they started this. Uh, see if we got any names there that we recognize. Uh, but, you know, I've said it over and over again. How cool is it 
for somewhere where you worked to say uh, a Humboldt. His name is Humboldt. H U M B O U L T. Humboldt. By golly. See, when you're a senior, you don't admit you don't know anything. You just wait and it'll come around. And yeah, that guy's name's Humboldt up there at the top. And uh, I think that's cool that we included that in there. Beautiful. Sandy, we want you on the show sometime. I think she lives over in the St. Petersburg area. And yes, John Young was here to help dedicate that. There's his um, handprints there and a different name there. Uh, this would have been um, on uh, May 2007. Okay. And there's his buddy, Charlie Duke, who's 87 years old. And uh, they would press their hands in the, the original mold was clay. And Charlie Mars said they had to pound the hands into it. You see his wedding ring on the left. And then they would sign it this with a, a, a big stick. Like think of a big uh, a uh, skewer that you'd use for meat or marshmallows. And that's what they used to dig in there and put whatever they wanted on there with their name. So uh, very cool. There is the beautiful shuttle monument. The shuttle monument groundbreaking was held in May 2002, just 12 years ago, and was dedicated November 2014. So I'm going to put in the ear to my boss that we have a 10-year anniversary of the dedication of this uh, monument, uh, which is just gorgeous. On each side of it are marble etchings uh, in, in, in the... Uh, I'm trying to think, who do I want to say... Um, just saw, him, just saw him yesterday, the caretaker of all this, who did the actual etchings on there. Warren Lackey, Warren Lackey, space worker. Uh, we could never pay Warren what in, in dollars what he gave and volunteered to do all this. And he goes out there and fixes things when they mess up. Occasionally, one of these sides will fall off because of the heat, uh, expose the heat and the, the, the adhesive that puts it together is, Bad. Not on the names, but on the, the pla plaques and stuff. But what a beautiful, iconic image of the, the shuttle. Uh, and uh, this was dedicated November 2014. Now, we were the U.S. Space Walk of Fame Foundation and Museum until 2016 when we were renamed the American Space Museum in October 2016, eight years ago. So there you have our little history in a nutshell there. Uh, hope that you personally come out here and seen these. If not, it's three blocks from our hotel, our, our museum. <coughs> and I'll be walking over there in about 10 minutes to see a rocket launch over there at Space View Park. Uh, as this is a beautiful place to see a space launch. Also, at our remembrance of the Columbia and Challenger accident, we have their names printed there, Apollo 1 also. Not... Very rarely do you not see flowers out there. At, at our line of duty column, and I'll show that again sometime, someone's always leaving a, uh, a, 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 a dozen roses, and often you see flowers here at that. So never to be forgotten are fallen space workers and astronauts. And a great place to watch a launch. There's off of the Space View Park. I didn't throw too many other pictures in there. But... Uh, I did throw this one in there. There's our buddy Ozzy, Ozban on the left. I love this picture, just looking at like his 600th launch of a, because uh, he saw from the shuttle on up and all kinds of uh, unmanned rocket launches. And we miss you. Everyone misses him out there at Space View Park. We had a terrific 321 March 21st celebration of Ozzy. Bringing, being the father of our area code 321. But there's the rocket hobo, and that's my last image to say that we love that man and miss him. Every time I'm out, I go out there, I subconsciously look for Ozzy sitting in that chair there and, and just say a small prayer that he's in paradise. So thank you all for watching today's Stay Curious. That includes Gary Gerald, Luke Clarson. Thank you for joining our family. Mark Usiak. Steve Jokums, hope you're home safely, my friend, at the Lake County Spaceport. And if he is, he's probably covered up with all the new orders for his wonderful modeling decal business there, Steve Jokums. 
Carlton Bailey's out there at the uh, Canaveral Groves Zoo. And uh, Bill Whiting, we miss you. And, you know, I know you miss us, but I hope you're having a good time in Michigan. Doug Forrest, thank you for your input. Tom Usiak, always. Neil 1030. Any, any, Neil 1030 is a good one for keeping me straight. So uh, I must have spit it all out right this time. Thank you, Neil. Robert Law up there in Dundee, Scotland, enjoying his evening cocktail. And Tom Celentano is watching. And here in the studio, we have Cliff Watson from Pomona, Australia. Is still here. All right. And still staying curious, yes. aren't you? Aren't Definitely. you? Thank you here. And we got Matthew, uh, another young man in here that uh, is going to help us on some tech, help Marty on the technical side of this. Matthew, I hope you enjoyed the controlled chaos that I go through every day at this time. It's uh, pretty much like that. Once in a while, I get a little more prepared, don't I, Marty? But um, thank you all for wonderful support of the American Space Museum. And thank my director, Karen Conklin, who's in a board meeting right now. Uh, for supporting all the endeavors that we do and have cooked up and none greater than our Shuttle Fest 3 event that we are so empowered to go on with thanks to you out there. So, Marty, thank you for a great Streamlabs programming there. And until tomorrow, guess who I got on tomorrow? I have got Daniel de Jong, the Netherlands, a Dutchman, a space geek, a pilot for giant jumbo airplanes on the Spirit uh, airlines. So we're going to have Daniel DeYoung in here to share some of the fun places he's been in space places and also uh, have him brag a little bit about why he keeps coming back to the Space Coast. And it's because of the people. We know that in our humble little museum. So Daniel DeYoung tomorrow, uh, Tom Usiek and uh, all you guys that have met him. Uh, so looking forward to it, Daniel. So until tomorrow, I'm Mark Marquette saying I can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us.